Families that are earning their own bread and butter are the victims that are doing the right thing to make a difference in their communities. Calling GPD is all they can do. Yeah, and neighborhood watches, right? Those are a big part of um, picking up the slack. Uh, Senator Sabina Perez, we were just chatting. Uh, so you, good morning, Senator. Thanks for joining us, by the way. And good morning, Chris. Good morning to the listening audience. So you said, what are you in a, a neighborhood watch chat or from which uh, village? Uh, well, actually, I've been in, in communication with a, mem- a member of the uh, Daddy Doe uh, Neighborhood Watch, and uh, they've been very proactive in working with the mayor and the police. They were able to host uh, a meeting with um, Chief Ignacio and, and try to get more police, uh, you know, police presence in Daddy Doe. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that's, you know, considering what's happening in Daddy Doe, a lot of a lot of crimes. Uh, we really need to dedicate a lot of resources. And, and in speaking with Chief, the Chief Ignacio, I know one of the issues was is they don't have enough uh, members in the police force. That's why they're recruiting more, more police officers. And so it's going to take a, a, you know, a multi-pronged approach to address the crime in our in our neighborhoods. Um, if, you know, I can also say that you know the um, you know drugs maybe you know o- oftentimes are associated. You know, as you saw in the, uh, the incident that it ended at the skate park. Uh, drinking was involved and you know those things are you know they they actually happen at, at you know an earlier age and so you know looking at you know holistic multi-pronged approaches I think it's important to even address it at the um, the youth level uh, whether it be in our schools um, you know as a as a former teacher of Simon Sanchez I know there were programs that were being implemented um, for intervention for drug intervention especially with alcohol yeah and you know, really, it is. It is a. a we, we need to take a holistic approach to these things. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, you know, as as a, as a citizen, it's also important to make sure that you know we are gauging our risks. So you know, being you know, um, and protecting ourselves. Uh, you know, just um, you know, all of these things need to to be in play uh, to prevent uh, any kind of incidents from happening. Um, yeah, everybody just needs to be more mindful now, especially um, there's there's more pressures within our society, you know, the, the cost going up, um, you know, just the, the pressure in, in our community is is um, increasing and, um, you know, we have to find ways to to address those um, yeah. individually and as, as, a, as a community. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Senator, I get where you're coming from, but it's like, how do you prepare for a situation where you're just driving down the road in Dedido and some idiot is shooting, you know, slingshots at, at people? It's just these kind of like, I mean, I understand you can do what you can do for your property to secure your life and your home and, and your family, you know, it, and all that stuff. But there's just these, it's like going out in the street. It's just not safe. It's just not safe, and I don't know how do you you prepare for that. Like here in Harmon, you know, at any given time, there's people walking around, whether they're uh, you know homeless or they're asking for money at the intersection, or they're just like gangs of these kids, like we see in in Dedito, where they got nothing better to do but get drunk and look for people to um, to beat up. And you know, Senator too, it's also uh, pretty alarming to me that these these crimes like this Dedito skate park riot is happening like within full view of the main highway you know it's not like they're mm-hmm. on a dead end way down the road or somewhere in swamp road maze or whatever it's like right there just like this incident last night you know so the patrols and all that it just seems so simple right to, to think like how do we solve this and and we always say the same thing oh we need more police presence and then you get out of loop saying oh we're hiring more officers but I think there's just that lag, right, where we're hiring more officers, but it's not like they can start today. They got to go through the academy. They got to do all this stuff. So, I mean, it seems pretty challenging. Yeah, and I must also say that you know I've been in also in cases where community looks out for you too as well. Yeah. So um, you know that that you know sense of goodness and community is still out there, and you know I think we we need to reconnect with that. And you know I, I know yeah families definitely the the idea of you know. Up, our upbringing, right? You know, how can we, um, you know, bring up our, our our children to to be more conscious, community minded? How can we, you know, develop policies that that work towards that? Um, so yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to take a community. It's going to take a holistic approach. You know, not one thing's going to solve it. That basically. Um, so yeah, different different things need to happen. 
Um, Senator, let's uh, switch gears a little bit, and I guess we can start with the Department of Revenue, Department of Revenue and uh, Taxation. I know you have oversight of uh, them, and we were talking a little bit about the tax refunds. Yes, so um, the DRT is working to get um, tax refunds within 30 days uh, of uh, filing an error-free tax filing. And um, so that's what their goal is. And um, they've been, I think, meeting it. So really uh, kudos to everybody at DRT and the Income Tax Division who are really putting out the work consistently. Um, And I think, yeah, you know, thanks to DRT for that. uh, the other thing is there is a deadline approaching. I believe it's March 20th. I need to double check that. But for those that have reached 55 years of age, um, they are eligible for uh, real estate um, uh, tax uh, discounts. Uh, I think it's, I believe it's like 70, if, if for your household, I believe it's uh, 70%. I, 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 it's pretty considerable. Uh, so for uh, your, your home tax, your residential tax, um, real estate property tax, it, it, there's a significant discount for those that are um, an UMCO. Um, so yeah, those are the, one of the two things, or actually the third thing was, um, I was just given the news yesterday that DRT is going to resubmit the bid for cigarette stamps. Um, they, uh, I guess, are following the, um, my recommendation that maybe we need to recast a broader net uh, because there are jurisdictions that are implementing the cigarette stamps um, and, you know, and considering that there are those that may not be um, sufficiently paying their their due to to the you know are paying their taxes uh, especially in light of the you know the master settlement agreement you know we have to comply with that so um so yeah that that's so, so be- senator what does that mean to you guys like if you're putting out another bid or rfp or whatever and you're casting a wider net does that mean that uh it's going to be publicized in places outside of guam uh that is that is my hope because there wasn't any vendor that that was um responsive here in guam unless they're you know plan for local um companies obviously that's the the, the preference is to give local companies uh the you know preference to to get these contracts, um, but yeah, definitely we need to if if there's no responsive bidder here on Guam, yeah. uh, it's important to expand the reach um, because it is being implemented in other jurisdictions, and this is so important to ensure that there's a, there's a level playing field, right? That and make sure that all the taxes are collected, and that money goes to to help pay for. Um, uh, many of the the benefits, uh, health benefits, GMH, Department of Public Health, uh, to reduce um, you know cigarette usage, um, also testing for cancers, uh, treatment of cancers. So um, these are really vital um, funding. Um, Senator, could we also? I wanted to ask for a comment here. Is uh, I, I know you're monitoring the situation with the uh, Red Hill, and, and it, it's been shut down. But just locally, right? Because you know we've got bases here too that do you know probably the same thing that a Red Hill in Hawaii does. Um, how confident are we that that type of Red Hill situation um, won't happen here? Well, um, that is something that I sent a letter to EPA. Uh, I did a request for information regarding any petroleum leaks here on Guam. Um, and it is my understanding from, you know, speaking with uh, uh, some of the members, they did, they were doing research on this um, in regards to pipeline leaks. And there have been historical leakage. Um, I just need to follow up and see, um, you know, the, what, what data they have. So it, it, you know, whenever there's a pipeline, it, it's always a concern. You know, they, they tend to leak, especially when we're talking about, you know, earthquake prone areas such as Guam. Um, and so this is something that is a, is a concern, especially if the pipelines are running through the northern uh, part of Guam where our aquifer is. Uh, so this this is definitely a concern and um, that that I need to uh, follow up with. Uh, open pit burning, uh, Senator. Any follow up on that? Uh, yeah, so the the one thing that I'm seeing in the in the national uh, arena is that um, there is a, a huge push to remove the exemption for open burn and open detonation. Um, as you know, the exemptions are for the military, but there are 
um, up until the time that there are safer alternatives. And so there was a report that was that was released recently uh, that that uh, showcases there are safer alternatives to open burning and open detonation. And um, you know, I think it's you know we need to protect our, the health of our community. Uh, open burning would just release would would it facilitate the release of toxic chemicals rather than break it down, especially uh, the forever chemical. Uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which PFAS. are found PFAS, exactly. Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is something that we, you know, we owe our community. Uh, and one of the, the, the another thing is uh, obviously the, the carcinogenic chemicals, other carcinogenic uh, chemicals like uranium, um, other um, chemicals that cause harm, such as lead, um, are also in, in the plant. So, it's important that these are not um, released. Um, this this permit has been in, in effect, uh, or since has been operating since I believe in the 1980s, and so you know unwittingly um, the community members have been exposed to these harmful chemicals, and cancer is a second leading cause of death in Guam, and um, so we really need to um, you know prevent these further releases from happening, especially if there are safer alternatives out there. Uh, Senator, you had a hearing on the paper bag uh, bill extension. Uh, were, were there uh, was there testimony of people having issues with the plastic bag ban? Can we just kind of cover that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, it looks like there was some confusion about uh, what is allowable in law. So the the basic thing that needs to be um, understood is that the disposable carry out plastic bags are banned. Um, so what we, you know, to carry out your groceries from a store, those those are banned. Yeah. Um, and initially the biodegradable ones were allowed, um, but we learned that the biodegradable, it, there's no such thing as a biodegradable plastic bag. What happens is the bag just breaks down into microplastics, which then end up in our food chain, which includes us. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's really important to, to continue that process um, especially now plastics are becoming harder to send off uh, to other other areas for yeah. cycling um, because of the Basel Convention. Uh, there are restrictions to shipping plastics for recycling. And um, we need to phase out the use of plastics uh, even more. I think uh, th it's important that we phase it out. Um, you know, plastics is a byproduct of oil. It's one of the, the byproducts of oil, and um, you know this is uh, one of the externalization of the environmental cost of using oil. Um, not to mention that, um, yeah, it, it's just uh, we have a limited land space. Uh, we can't continue to put in materials that are not going to break down. The senator, and so are for just to clarify, because you said people are confused about what is allowed uh, in the law for restaurants and takeout. Are they still able to use the plastic bags, or no? No. no, they're not. So nobody can yeah. use plastic bags. Uh, not for yeah, disposable carry out. They're they're completely banned. Got it. Uh, so what were some of the issues that people uh, had with the plastic bag uh, ban? Were they just complaining about it? Or well, I think part of it there were exemptions. So for instance, um, the when when you go to a grocery store, you put your your fruits and vegetables in a plastic bag. That's right. allowed. Yeah. Um, you know, laundry, uh, dry cleaning bags that's allowable too. So that's, there were some exemptions that are causing some sort of confusion. Yeah. Well, they must have had a good lobby. Uh, but why is, why would we allow some plastics and not others if the thinking is that it's all going to the landfill? Yeah. I, you know, I, I agree that maybe there's, there should be a next step to thinking about what are the alternatives to that. Um, I think initially it was thought that protecting the product. So for instance, like meats, uh, meat products, you know, the idea that putting them in paper would just create uh, more of a problem and um, the product would not be protected. Mm. Uh, so that, and it could be a, a health issue too as well. Right, right. So yeah. maybe in those cases, like where it's, um, it won't Yeah, really where your chicken juice, your raw chicken juice drips out of the package onto your apples. It happens all the time, Senator. It sucks. Right. Uh, Senator, while we're talking about plastics, I wanted to cue this video here. Um, I sent it to you last night. I don't know if you got a chance to, to look at it, but this is the EPAN, Eastside, 
And I don't know if it's just the time of year, but this has actually happened a couple, a few times over the last uh, couple years. And I was talking with uh, um, a resident. Well, it was Dr. Ann Pabutsky of Public Health, but she was not wearing her public health hat. Um, and basically what a lot of residents uh, think is happening is they think that some of these big ships are throwing their trash overboard and then it's washing up on the east side and breaking up into just like millions upon millions of pieces as you can see the video here guys and this is epan kind of behind the jones beach uh area where you can see it's like shredded plastic bags and all kinds of just plastic containers and this is not something that someone dumped on the beach because when i looked at the containers when people look at them these are plastics that are from uh with the labeling as far away as indonesia even a lot of chinese products and so when I was talking with his resident uh, yesterday, they were saying that they think that these uh, long liners throw the bags over and they end up washing up over here um, on our side. But as you can see, it's, it's pretty crazy, um, Senator. Uh, is this something like, wh who, where would the jurisdiction be with this? Is this something that we can address kind of uh, locally? Uh, because it, uh, as you can see, it's very frustrating because it's not like someone went through the jungle and dumped. It's not your traditional Ill illegal a dumping thing and this has happened like a, a few times you talk to anybody on on the east side i think even as far down as uh in alahan um maybe it's because of the way the current is coming this time of year uh it seems to happen a lot yeah so this would probably be you know if it's happening in the open seas it would be the united nations mm. uh probably would have this jurisdiction i think there are some signatories to the u.n convention of the law of the sea and um I would have to see which countries have signed on, uh, but in any case, uh, if they haven't, uh, you know, I guess it would be important to to look and see what avenues there are for any kind kind of an enforcement uh, when it comes to dumping. I, I mean, it's really sad to see that the our, our oceans are seen as dumping grounds. Um, you know, you know the incident with the the incident with Japan where they wanted to dump radiation, uh, nuclear radiation waste, yeah. and then we have you know, plastics. And um, yeah, it's definitely something has, this has to be addressed. And this is more of like, if it is happening, uh, if these uh, international commercial fishing ships are doing this, I'm sure there's some sort of regulation, right. international regulation. All right. So we're going to the UN. Let me know when we're going. I got to pack my bags. <laughs> um, Senator, if we could just uh, lastly, the, the financial management system, I know that uh, this has been something that this is going back, guys, and I don't know if it's still under an emergency procurement, but this was something they slipped into an executive order in November of 2020. 2020. It's 2022. And so I'm not even sure what the status is with it, Senator. I know Nestor did, they did an update, but just if you could, what is the status? Is it still an emergency procurement? And how close are we to finally, finally, finally securing the finally financial management system for GovGuam? So, yeah, I think I don't have any updates regarding whether they did award a contract, but I think what's very, uh, sometime, sometimes uh, there's a confusion with regards to emergency and RFP. So those two are different things. So RFP is competitive. It's a competitive process. And emergency procurement is is uh, three quotes. You just get three quotes, get the, you know, the best, uh, the most responsive bidder, uh, low, potentially, hopefully, lowest lowest cost bidder. Um, but so if, the, from my understanding, there, there was an RFP for this. So it's, it, it is a competitive bid. Okay. And it's being handled by uh, DOA. Right. And so basically they, the emergency thing wasn't working out, so they kind of switched to an RFP, right? Uh, I'm not too sure. But, yeah, I think I just want to say that, you know, the just because we're in a public health emergency, uh, we should still do our due diligence, due diligence and try to get competitive bids, competitive proposals. Um, yeah, it's... it's um, there should be, yeah, and there's still a law, the law is still in place that um, you don't use it because you, you know, an agency didn't properly plan ahead because that is, was not, um, it was foreseeable. If it's, if the, if the require, uh, the need is a foreseeable need, then there should not, they, uh, it's not, emergency procurement should not be used. You need to go, the law says that you, uh, the agency needs to use competitive the competitive process.
Man, if I had a dollar for every time you said it, said that during this pandemic, who I'd be retired. <laughs> At least you're yeah. consistent, Senator. And I'm still seeing that. Um, you know, I think with the um, the bag baggage from the airport, uh, if I'm not if not mistaken, it was an emergency procurement, and that's something that's a foreseeable right. uh, need. It should have been done with a competitive prop through a competitive process. Uh, contractors licensing board. Uh, since you you mentioned that, uh, did you have a comment on the recent developments uh, where they're now looking at everything? I mean, the guy's name was Buddy, right? <laughs> I mean, how do we not like be suspicious of a guy in a position to make these calls? Then his name is Buddy. You know what I mean? Hey, Buddy. That should have been like eyes on this guy the whole time. Uh, but yeah, Senator, your comment. Oh, um, yeah, the, I think what needs to happen is there needs to be an administrative change where it has to be very clear in the specifications as what is needed to be responsible, a responsible bidder, you know, what type of certifications, uh, licenses. I think that would definitely go a long way to preventing any of this from happening in regards to, uh, you know, whether a contractor needs to have a contractor's license versus a business license, right? Um, so that the agency really has to take the lead on that one. Right on, Senator. Thank you. Uh, anything in closing? Um, I just want to um, also actually I want to make, uh, congratulate. You know, uh, this month is Career Technical Education Month, and I just want to give a shout out or kudos to the um, the chapter of Guam. Uh, you know, Guam Guam contractor. Uh, Trades Academy, uh, they were able to get a um, um, grant to pay for solar solar panels for their parking lot, mm. and um, and uh, so I just want to you know congratulate uh, Bert Johnson and his team um, for for um, you know promoting uh, you know renewable energy. Plus, also uh, what what's tied into that is they're going to increase. Uh, uh, apprenticeships for solar panel um, engineers and and um, um, tradesmen. So, uh, yeah. So I just want to congratulate them. But um, also, yeah. Thank you for being for having me on the show. Yeah, oh, today. Senator, because you mentioned Bert Johnson, and that made me think of Guam Waterworks Authority. And I know that you had a bill. I want to say it was like was it two six six? And this is a bill where uh, if there's a water leak on the private property side. Um, uh, so what it would enable GWA to go in and fix that, but can we, can you tell me about that? Yes. Yeah, so there are many cases, many constituents that I've heard that, um, they, uh, are accruing a huge, uh, water bill because of a water leak and GWA, um, basically, um, does not, you know, is unable to step in and help repair these water leaks. And so I think it's really important to, to kind of bridge that gap. Um, especially with our resource, you know, we need to protect our water resource as well as help the, the customer uh, from getting uh, amassing these huge unmanageable bills. Right. If something can be done about it at the, at the very start. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, I hear customers, uh, what they go through and having to kind of resolve the issue and GWA cannot step in and help them with that. And um, also I think it's really important to, um, uh, GW is also in the process of developing a customer assistance program for uh, low and fis fixed income uh, rate care. I think so is, that, is that who would be eligible for for this uh, in this bill, Senator? Because I I feel like if uh, you know like a private multi million dollar business has a leak on their side, it's not like GWA would go in and fix that. You're talking about uh, people who are um, income challenged, right? When they get a leak, and I've actually had this happen. So. Uh, is the thinking also that GWA system is so antiquated that, you know, a lot of the leaks on the private side are just because of old pipes and all that stuff? I mean, it's kind of a chain reaction, right? Well, I think, you know, generally the, the infrastructure is aging overall, whether it's on the public or private side. And, you know, when we have a leak on either side, it, it's, it's going to ultimately affect, um, you know, it's going to affect the rates, um, you know, because eventually, you know, if a customer can't, for this, um, it's going to become non-revenue water, from my thinking, um, and you know we need to to, to address it uh, proactively. Yeah, I think the proactive measure that um, you know I you know I think it's important. It would help overall. You know, it's, I think it's a win-win situation. 
um, for everyone involved. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, if you open up the water meter and it's spinning like crazy and there's probably a leak on your side, I mean, I've, I've seen these leaks rack up like, you know, hundreds of dollars a day. So good idea. Yeah, and it would, it would also help reduce rates, I think, too, because, you know, water is so, it costs a lot of money or it takes a lot of energy to pump water from one place to another. And energy is one of the higher costs on Guam. Oh, yeah. If we can cut out the leaks, um, that would help with the, it would help with the rates, I think, overall. Hey, do you think that, so this program in Salupi, right, the governor came out, remember she came out and announced that they're going to do 300 bucks, $100 a month, uh, and I think it's going to, it's supposed to kick off next week, but do you think, given the the more recent increases in the price of gas, that we should re-examine that amount and maybe increase it, or just what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I have to take a look at that, but of course, I think, um, you know, cost of living uh, has gone up significantly, um, you know, in Guam, and, we're, you know, we're seeing that nationwide. So we're seeing what's happening nationwide has been happening in Guam for such a long time. And, um, yeah, I think uh, we need to kind of reevaluate uh, whether we can re out, you know, increase the, the money. But, yeah, that's something that needs to be looked at. Thank you, Senator. Good talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank right you. on. Senator Sabina Perez, uh, good morning, 738. It's Thursday, March 10th. We did have a couple comments here. Um, again, comments in. I'm encouraged by Senator Sabina's bills focusing on water leaks. They're an important step in addressing a longstanding issue plaguing the island. Uh, Caddy Pena comments in. Hoffaday, trust in Jesus. Amen. Right on.